time for the Longine Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. A presentation of the Longine Whitnor Watch Company, maker of Longine, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world-honored Longine. Good evening, this is Frank Knight. May I introduce our co-editors for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope? Mr. William Bradford Huey, editor of the American Mercury, and Mr. Henry Hazlitt, contributing editor of Newsweek magazine. Our distinguished guest for this evening is the Honorable Joseph R. McCarthy, United States Senator from Wisconsin. The opinions expressed are necessarily those of the speakers. Senator McCarthy, our viewers, of course, know that you are one of the most controversial political figures of our time. And this is your first appearance since your rather overwhelming victory in the Wisconsin primaries. Now, sir, uh, what uh, brings you east at this time? Your program largely, Mr. Huey. And uh, I believe that uh, also this week you expect to uh, make an address in Connecticut. Is that correct, I'm sir? I'm speaking tomorrow night at the Klein Memorial Hall at Bridgeport, Connecticut. And, uh, of course, our viewers know that uh, in Connecticut, uh, that's the home state of uh, a man that you've had a few words with, Senator Bill Benton. Now, sir, uh, uh, what... what What's the purpose of your going into into Connecticut? Is it to defeat Senator Benton or to try to help defeat Senator Benton? My purpose, uh, Mr. Huey, will be about the same as the purpose in some 12, 13 states I'll visit, and that is to bring important facts to the American people. You see, I, I get a very strong feeling that uh, the most of our people in public life underestimate the intelligence of the American people. Uh, they try to argue and tell people how to vote. I think you need merely give the people the facts, and then you can go home and don't worry, they'll vote right. Well, now, at Bridgeport, Connecticut, uh, do I understand you correct to say, when you, to say that you are opening a, a, a 12 or 13 state uh, drive now in support of the national ticket? I think I'll be in, I may be wrong on the number, Mr. Huey, I think that I am now scheduled to speak in some 13 or 14 states where they have close senatorial contests. Well, Senator, a lot of people came into your state, into Wisconsin, to try to defeat you in the primaries, and it seemed to have worked the other way. Mm -hmm. Now, don't you think that perhaps when you go into these states, it may have that sort of effect? Well, Mr. Hazlitt, uh, uh, that's Brent Hazlitt, right? That's right. I'm sorry. <laughs> Mr. Hazlitt, I do not intend to go into those states and tell the people how to vote. I don't intend to go in and, and discuss the local men running for Congress or for Senator. I intend to go into those states and give the American people uh, the cold documented picture of the sellout in Korea, the extent to which communism has been directing our foreign policy, uh, our suicidal foreign policy, if you please. And if the American people want more of that, then they can vote for the present administration. I may say this, uh, that my appeal is, uh, is largely made to Democrats. Uh, I feel that the millions of Americans who have long voted the Democrat ticket are just as loyal, they love America just as much, they hate communism just as much as the average Republican. And I think it is up to those uh, loyal Democrats to realize that as of today, they don't have a party in Washington. The only way they can uh, have a change is by voting Republican. Well, do you think a lot of Democrats came in and voted for you in the Wisconsin election? I don't think it. I, I know it. Uh, our normal, let's put it this way, two years ago, the Democratic vote was about 47% of the total. The Republicans vote 53%. This year, we had a, uh, let's see, I think these figures are right, 83% Republican vote, 17% Democrat vote, and most of the Democrats uh, apparently voted for McCarthy because I carried the Democrat ward uh, normally better than I carry the Republican wards, which, which uh, proves my contention, and that is that in this fight against communism, it isn't a Democrat fight, it isn't a Republican fight. And for that reason, I don't go into any state and tell the people how to vote. What is the broader interpretation of your own victory in Wisconsin as you see it? Well, I would say, Mr. Hazlitt, number one, uh, it was not a vote for McCarthy. Uh, it was a vote on an issue an all-important issue. The American people recognize that the one real issue 
uh, not the phony issue, was the issue of communism, uh, corruption, all tied up with the Korean War and uh, World War, call it two and a half, call it a police action, call it what you may. It means that the American people are sick way down deep inside at what's been going on. And that, it, it was, I'd like to consider it a tribute to McCarthy, but it was not, it was a vote upon an all-important issue. And I just hope that uh, many of our good friends realize that that is the well, issue of this well year. Well, you imply, Senator, by saying that they didn't vote for McCarthy, you imply that you've become something of a symbol now to a large group of Americans. Now, just what do you believe you symbolize in the American political scene now? I don't, I don't uh, quite like the way you put that question, Mr. Huey. Uh, let's put it this way. Uh, uh, many people have been waiting for someone to expose the extent to which our suicidal foreign policy has been dictated from the Kremlin. Uh, they've been waiting for someone to really get up and fight corruption the way men like Senator Williams have fought it. And uh, I think my people in Wisconsin were voting in approval of a fight against communism, corruption, the sellout of American interests. And uh, uh, they weren't voting they weren't voting for Joe McCarthy. Well, would you I, I, happen, I happen to be the recipient of the vote yeah. and I certainly I uh, appreciate it a great deal. Well, would you say the other side of that coin is that you were the recipient of all the protest vote in Wisconsin? I mean, that, that they were voting for you in order to protest against uh, what, what you outline uh, have been the failures of the administration. That, that might well be, uh, Mr. Huey. Senator, I wanted to ask you about this word, McCarthyism. Mm -hmm. Am I right in supposing that the first one who used that word was Owen Lattimore in testimony before the Tidings Committee? Owen Lattimore first used it. Uh, let, me, let me correct myself. I think it was first used by Lattimore or by the Daily Worker, but the testimony now is that 40 top communists met in New York and decided how they would fight McCarthy and that they then coined the phrase McCarthyism. Now, as to the date of that, whether that was the day before Lattimore testimi testified or the day after, I frankly don't know. But that's the origin, as you see it. Either the Daily Worker's publication of it or the Owen Lattimore testimony was the yes. first time it was used. Or, or the, t the testimony by uh, uh, Howard Rushmore, the yes. 40 communists met and said, we'll, we'll coin the phrase McCarthyism and use that. Yes. I wanted to ask you here something about a point that came up in the testimony uh, the congressional testimony about the Institute of Pacific Relations. Uh, this was about a year ago, and it was a letter uh, written by the uh, secretary of the IPR uh, to a Mr. Barnett asking about a meeting they were going to have at Mount Tremblant and the people that they ought to invite to that meeting. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, William Lockwood uh, says here in, in writing as secretary of the IPR, Another possibility we might consider is someone from Knox's office or Stimson's. Cohen Hiss, meaning Alger Hiss, mentioned Adlai Stevens, one of Knox's special assistants. Well, that must mean Adlai Stevenson because uh, there, uh, he was one of Knox's special mm -hmm. assistants then and there was no Stevens. Now, why, in your opinion, would uh, Hiss, back in 1942, have recommended Adlai Stevenson as a participant in that meeting uh, what qualifications did Adlai Stevenson have as, a, let's say, a Far Eastern expert at that time? All the qualifications that Alger Hiss wanted in a man, I would say. And uh, keep in mind that Cole, the other man recommended by Alger Hiss, has been named under oath seven times as either a communist or an espionage agent. Uh, uh, I mean, let, 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 let me say this. I'd rather not go to Stevenson's record in too great detail at this time because we have just completed a complete and thorough research on Adlai Stevenson. Who is I'm, we? Uh, 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 well, <laughs> uh, and, uh, and I intend to uh, give that picture on a nationwide network and television, I hope, also. And after I give that picture of Stevenson, it isn't a picture that I've created. It's his own history. It's Adlai Stevenson's history of Adlai Stevenson since the time he entered the Agricultural Department in 1933 when Alger Hiss and Perlman the rest entered. And after I give that history of Stevenson, uh, if the American people want him, they can have him. I don't think they'll want him. Well, uh, Senator, I gather from what you say that it's fair to infer that you will not avoid personalities 
uh, in your 13 states that you expect to speak in now? I will never avoid giving the facts to the American people, Mr. Huey. It's so easy, you see, to talk about communism generally, to talk about the sellout in China and Korea generally. But unless you call the role of the traitors, unless you call the role of those who have been responsible for the suicidal foreign policy, it's a waste of the speaker's time and the audience time. And I don't intend to ever get up and, in general terms, talk about treason, talk about sellouts. I, you see, foreign policy isn't like little Topsy, it doesn't just grow. Treason isn't like little Topsy, it doesn't just grow. It's created by men with faces and men with names. And I think those of us who have been elected by the American people to man the watchtowers, unless we have the intelligence to recognize the traitors, and then, if I may use a word which we use in Wisconsin, unless we have the guts to name them, we should be taken down from those watchtowers and should not be representing the American people. And I don't intend to ever avoid giving the names of traitors, giving the names of communists, when I discover them in an important position. Well, Senator, we appreciate it very much for your being with us tonight. Well, thank, thank you, Mr. Hesler. The editorial board for this edition of the Longine Chronoscope was Mr. William Bradford Huey and Mr. Henry Hazlitt. Our distinguished guest was the Honorable Joseph R. McCarthy, United States Senator from Wisconsin. It's World Series time again, the best days of the year for baseball fans. And this year again, the World Series is Longine time. Yes, all umpires of both American and National Baseball Leagues use Longine watches exclusively for timing all the games, including the World Series. Truly, the most honored watch in the world of sport is Longine, the world's most honored watch. The only watch in history to win 10 World's Fair grand prizes, 28 gold medals, and so many honors for accuracy in fields of precise timing. Now that's why, throughout the world, no other name on a watch carries the prestige of Longines, the world's most honored watch in sport. The watch of first choice with discriminating people the world over. And yet do you know that you may buy and own or buy and proudly give a Longines watch for as little as seventy-one fifty. Longines, the world's most honored watch, premier product of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company since 1866, maker of watches of the highest character. We invite you to join us every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday evening at this same time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, broadcast on behalf of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world honored Longines. This is Frank Knight, reminding you that Longines and Whitnor watches are sold and serviced from coast to coast by more than 4,000 leading jewelers who proudly display this emblem, Agency for Longines Whitnor Watches.